After years of conflict in the Middle East and Afghanistan, Americans might have expected that some of their country's huge defense budget would be diverted to more pressing domestic concerns. But with US strategic priorities now switching to the Asia Pacific region, will America's top generals ever allow their spending to be cut? The United States spends almost as much on its military as the rest of the world combined. Since 9-11, America's base defense budget increased by about $1 trillion. Nearly another trillion and a half was spent on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now the U.S. exit from Iraq is complete, and 20,000 American troops left Afghanistan last year the start of a drawdown that will be finished by 2014. The stage is set for America to redirect public funds from the military to domestic needs, to reap the benefits of a so-called peace dividend. But will that happen? Will the political dynamics of defense spending in the U.S. permit it? In Washington, D.C., a battle has already begun to ward off cuts to the defense budget. Our soldiers, our young men and women, are the ones who will pay the price, potentially with their lives. In appearances on Capitol Hill, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have warned of dire results from some $41 billion in defense cuts this year mandated by sequestration, a budgetary process agreed to by Republicans and President Obama in a 2011 deal. Sequestration will upend our defense strategy. It will put the nation at greater risk of coercion. I've looked at the effects of the sequester, and they're really quite modest in terms of the Pentagon's overall budget. Chuck Spinney worked at the Pentagon for 26 years as an analyst in the Secretary of Defense's office. So this was when you testified before Congress, is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's I know a lot about the waste and, and abuse that's inside the defense budget. Do you think that the defense cuts being talked about are a peace dividend after the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? No, it's not even close. After sequestration, funding for the U.S. Department of Defense will still be above the Cold War average in real terms and close to the highest level since World War II. We would be spending slightly less than the Vietnam peak. We'll be spending more than we spent when Eisenhower was, was president. And remember, those were the totals he complained about when he made his military-industrial complex speech. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In his final speech as president in 1961, Dwight Eisenhower warned the country about the power of a military-industrial complex to shape national priorities. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Spinney says the workings of the military-industrial complex today make it difficult for the U.S. to secure a peace dividend. It's what in Washington we call an iron triangle. You have an alliance between the private sector, the defense contractors, the executive branch, in this case the Pentagon, and the legislative branch. All benefit from expensive procurement projects. The Pentagon gets weapons, defense companies get profits, Impact. and politicians get reelected by funding armaments that generate jobs for constituents. Basically, what we have is a budget that is packed to the gills with weapons we don't need with weapons that are underestimated in their future costs. Is it common operating procedure for Pentagon officials and companies to lowball price and oversell performance in the early stages of a project? Yes. It's ubiquitous. Basically, the idea is to turn on the money spigot. And then the second phase of the operation is known as political engineering, and that's the spreading of subcontracts and benefits from that program's existence in terms of employment or profits to as many congressional districts as quickly as possible so that once the cost growth becomes apparent or the performance reductions become apparent, you can't do anything about it because there's too much political support. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is a textbook case of underestimated costs and political engineering. 
Three versions of the F-35 for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines are being built by Lockheed Martin, the biggest U.S. defense contractor. The F-35 project was supposed to cost $226 billion for about 2,900 aircraft. Now the plan is to buy only 2,400 for $400 billion. That's a price increase of close to 100 percent. It's going to be the most expensive program ever conceived in the Department of Defense. As a Pentagon aircraft engineer, Pierre Spray played a key role in the design and procurement of the F-16 fighter and the A-10 ground support plane, two mainstays of America's current Air Force fleet. What's the difference between the way this plane was developed and the F-35 program? They're dead opposites. Companies had to compete for the F-16 and A-10 contracts by building advanced prototypes. You actually had to fly the prototypes and they had to fight. And the outcome of that fight would determine who won. The F-35 had a totally fraudulent uh, set of prototypes that in no way resembled the final airplane and that had no fly-off at all. In fact, they just simply tore up the plans for the prototypes and started all over again. The aircraft has been beset by a litany of engineering and performance problems. I see an airplane that's as fat as a pregnant goose, you know, huge fuselage, cross-section, all kinds of drag, a tiny wing that doesn't let you turn. So you have terrible range on this airplane, terrible payload, you know, no maneuverability, and a thing that's a fire and an explosion waiting to happen. You know, this is the most vulnerable fighter I think we've ever built. In addition to the hundreds of billions to produce the aircraft, it is estimated that more than a trillion dollars will be needed to operate and maintain the F-35. If it's let loose and carried all the way to 2400, there will be so little money left over for anything that's needed, it'll be unbelievable. They'll be cutting people, pilots, training, everything, just to pay for this thing. What do you think should be done with the F-35 program? Cancel it today. The later you let it run, the worse off the country is. But the F-35 has maintained support in Congress despite all its problems. Lockheed's political engineering strategy is evident on its website, which claims the program provides 127,000 jobs in 47 states and Puerto Rico. In addition to the 47 states in the United States, there are now eight countries involved in its design and production, including Italy, Australia, the UK, and a few others. So that makes it difficult to make cuts. It makes it even more difficult to cut the program, because now you're creating an international incident of some kind. That's no accident. It was done deliberately. Lockheed expects record profits this year. Its CEO declined our request for an interview. But at a meeting of the Air Force Association in February, we caught up with Lockheed's F-35 spokesman, Mike Rain. We saw 2012 and into 2013 as a step of great progress for the program and, and certainly going in the right direction. The F-35 program is seven years behind schedule and costs more than 70 percent more than planned. Why is that? The early test phases and the early production phases, they did have some issues. A lot of critics say that the companies and the Pentagon lowball it to get the commitment of Congress and then the price goes up. Isn't that what Lockheed did here? I absolutely disagree with that statement. Many people who work at Lockheed Martin, such as myself, are 20-year veterans of the American military, okay? What do you say to people who are concerned that the cost of the F-35 program could squeeze out funds for readiness and other procurement projects? I have total confidence in the Secretary of Defense and on down in the leadership that they will make the right decisions for our military, that none of that will be sacrificed in order to bring the F-35 online. Lockheed is one of the major funders of the Air Force Association. Why? Because we believe in it. The Air Force Association exists uh, to help educate the American public on the value of air power. Retired General Greg McKinley is president of the Air Force Association. The AFA is one of the most powerful groups in Washington. It has 100,000 members in 230 state chapters, advocating on behalf of expensive weapon systems like the F-35. I think the U.S. can afford it. It's a great nation. The U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff, General Mark Welsh, attended the Air Force Association meeting. Welsh is a major proponent of the F-35. Uh, Get-togethers like this that expose uh, industry to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, to the Secretary of the Air Force, to our major commanders, those are things that we think are very important. 
70% of three- and four-star generals who retired between 2008 and 2011 went to work in the defense industry. For companies like Lockheed and other top defense contractors who are major funders of the Air Force Association. Pentagon spending is high in part because of the revolving door. You know, people go uh, from industry and from government back and forth. William Hartung is a defense industry analyst with the Center for International Policy. If you're sitting across the table from a company negotiating a contract with them, and in the back of your mind you're saying, God, I could get a good job with these folks if I don't go too hard on them, and then the, the taxpayer is not going to get the best deal. Uh, and that happens over and over again. There are also hundreds of lobbyists for the defense industry who work for congressional committees and federal agencies. The past head of the Federal Aviation Administration, Marion Blakey, is president and CEO of the Aerospace Industries Association, a top defense industry trade group. Sequestration is terrible policy. It will result in a hollow force for our military, and it will force our economy back into recession. Blakey has been making the rounds for months, warning that a million jobs will be lost as a result of defense cuts. I've looked at their studies. It might be 300,000. And many of those 300,000 will get new jobs, because if you spend money in education, spend money on infrastructure, almost anything else you can use the money for uh, can create one and a half to two times as many jobs. So the economy would be much better off spending money on things other than the Pentagon. Blakey and the Aerospace Industries Association declined our request for an interview. Pentagon contractors have for years used the jobs argument to revive weapon systems that have been canceled, uh, to push for things that even uh, the Pentagon itself has not wanted. A prime example is the Abrams M1 tank. The U.S. Army hoped to save billions by shutting down M1 production at the Joint Systems Manufacturing Center in Lima, Ohio. But for example, in Lima, it would cost us $2.8 billion to keep that open. But Congress didn't go along with the plan. In the last two years, it provided about $355 million to keep the M1 production line rolling at the General Dynamics plant. This is a Joint Systems Manufacturing Center right here. Jed Metzger of the Lima Chamber of Commerce is on a community task force that was set up to save the jobs at the tank plant. That was a point that we've tried to prove over and over again that you'll still need uh, tanks to fight future wars. The Pentagon sees little use for the M1 in confronting 21st century threats like terrorism and piracy. So members of Congress uh, representing Ohio came down here you brought them down here, is that right? Everybody in Congress that we possibly could get uh, to come to the uh, uh, facility. In the last two years, General Dynamics spent more than $22 million lobbying Congress and $2 million on campaign contributions. Almost every member is going to go to bat for a weapon system that's built in part in their district. And then there'll be a sort of log rolling process where, you know, I'll support your weapon system if you support my weapon system. And so once that you know, horse trading goes on, then it's much harder to cut anything. It seems that you've won the argument with congressmen. Yes. David Berger is the mayor of Lima. The Army said that by pausing production, they could save close to $3 billion. I believe that the uh, General Dynamics and their partners have created a case that shows that that uh, savings is, is not valid. Have you ever seen those studies? Because I've been trying like crazy to get the studies. General Dynamics claims that it will cost more to restart M1 production in the future if it's needed than to keep the plant open now. After 9-11, the tank plant was able to gear up production. Why can't that be done in the future in the same way? First of all, no one's saying it's not possible. Um, what we are saying is that it's more expensive. And that's according to the General Dynamics study? Correct. Which you haven't seen? Which I have not seen. General Dynamics declined our request for their cost study and for an interview. These defense contractors cannot convert to private sector procurement. They're basically like welfare queens in an economic sense. They're dependent on the cash flow. Do you think overall the U.S. economy is too dependent on defense spending? Absolutely. The defense industry has basically siphoned off technology and finance capital that were essential for the improvement of the productivity of our economy. It also soaks up, and this is probably the most crucial resource, it soaks up engineering and scientific talent. 
One area soaking up a large share of America's scientific and engineering talent is its nuclear arms industry. At one point, the best estimate was that between us and the Soviet Union, we had created some 70,000 nuclear weapons. Thomas Pickering, a former top American diplomat, helped negotiate strategic arms limitation treaties with the Soviet Union. He recently served on a commission which recommended major changes in America's nuclear posture. It results in savings that over a period of time can result in tens and even hundreds of billions of dollars. The commission was part of the anti-nuclear arms group Global Zero. It recommended reducing the number of U.S. nuclear warheads from 5,000 to 900. The commission also called for changes in America's nuclear delivery triad of ballistic missiles, submarines, and bombers. There was a very strong feeling that two elements of the triad uh, were sufficient. It's been reported that the Obama administration is considering nuclear weapons cuts, but those savings will be difficult to achieve. There's two pillars that are supporting the nuclear weapons complex at this point. One is people are still mired in Cold War thinking, and they feel like the more uh, nuclear weapons we have, the better. But in addition to that, the, the nuclear weapons industry has some of the biggest, strongest companies in the military industrial complex. I'm a little, more than a little troubled by the report that you participated in, the Global Zero Report. Chuck Hagel, the new U.S. Secretary of Defense, was also on the Global Zero Commission. At his confirmation hearing, he was attacked by senators whose states have a stake in the nuclear weapons business. Your report explicitly calls for, quote, an urgent and transformational change in the U.S. nuclear force structure, strategy, and posture, close quote. I, I think it's a rather it's an exceedingly dramatic a report, frankly. Conservative think tanks in Washington, like the Heritage Foundation, also attacked Hegel. You could zero out the whole Department of Defense and save a lot of money. It would also be a very foolish thing to do. Steve Bucci is director of the Center for Foreign Policy Studies at Heritage. He was a top assistant to George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. How many nuclear weapons do you think we need? I think we should maintain the force that we have right now. So you think the numbers themselves are helpful? They have a value of their own, absolutely. What is it? What is the value? Ten nuclear weapons that can be fired at me. Uh, would certainly wake me up if I was a leader of another country. What's the difference between that and 5,000? Well, if we only had one adversary in the world, it might be easier to cut the numbers down, but we don't only have one adversary. You know, in, in North Korea, it's a little hard to think of North Korea as a rational actor uh, when based on some of the things they do. If you have 900 or 5,000, he still can be irrational. If he's going to be rational, one can be as good as 5,000, no? No, I don't think that's an accurate uh, calculus. Increasingly, uh, think tanks have become an element within the military-industrial complex because they're uh, where a lot of the ideas are promoted, ideas that will result in keeping the Pentagon budget as high as possible. Uh, we're very pleased to have all of you here today at uh, the Defending Defense event. Heritage, which receives defense industry funding, has joined together with two other think tanks in a campaign to ward off military cuts. A major reason is the potential threat they see from China. China cannot be underestimated. We have to have enough capability so that should China decide to become more aggressive and more hostile, that we would be ready to protect not only our own national interests, but to to help out the allies that are there. It is estimated that China spends between one quarter and one fifth as much on its military as the U.S. We need a threat. The Al Qaeda has sort of run out of string. And we have to have a new threat to justify continued spending. That's what the whole pivot to Asia is about. Good morning, everybody. Last year, the Obama administration Forward. announced Obama that it was shifting American strength. military resources to the Asia Pacific Australia. region. We will be strengthening our presence in the Asia-Pacific, and budget reductions will not come at the expense of that critical region. The Pentagon is working on a new warfighting strategy for the Asia-Pacific called Air-Sea Battle that was discussed at the Air Force Association meeting. So that's very simple. We're taking all the Air Force stuff, we're taking all the Navy stuff, we're looking at what kind of world we're facing in the future, and how do we make all of this stuff 
work much more closely together. Air Sea Battle aims to combat Chinese threats to navigation in the South and East China Seas. In war games, these threats are referred to as anti-access area denial, or A2AD, capabilities. One of the um, tenets of how we think we need to operate in the future involves uh, unimpeded access to the global commons. It's international airspace and water space, freedom of navigation through there. If you go for an anti-access capability, an area denial capability, you're talking about deep strike penetration. That means stealth, that means jammers, that means electronics, it means long-range missiles. It's nirvana. For the, for the company? For the companies. And their allies in the Navy and the, and the Air Force. So the Asia-Pacific pivot is a strategy well-suited for the military-industrial congressional complex because we're basically talking about high-tech weapons, high-cost weapons. To better understand the U.S. military's new strategy for Eastern Asia, we travel to the furthest American territory in the Western Pacific, close to sea lanes near China. U.S. military installations here on the island of Guam will play a key role in the American pivot to the Asia-Pacific region. Expensive new weapons like the F-35 fighter and attack submarines will be based on Guam. There are also plans to spend billions of dollars to move thousands of Marines here, the first step in what could be a major military buildup on the island. Cope North, a training exercise involving the U.S., Japanese, and Australian Air Forces, was taking place at Anderson Air Force Base while we were on the island. They were practicing air-sea battle tactics. The term that is used often is uh, networked integrated attack capability. The stealth aircraft finds a target, the submarine that's stealthy shoots the weapon, and the stealth airplane guides the weapon to the target. Those U.S. General Herbert Carlyle, the commander of Pacific Air Forces, was overseeing the joint exercise. Can you talk about the role that potential anti-access and aerial denial threats from China play in the Cope North exercises? They are important scenarios that you're preparing to counter, aren't they? Uh, yeah, but I would, uh, the only caution I would make is I don't think I would point at one country. Uh, you can look at many places and say that they have an anti-access air denial capability. Certainly uh, the weapons, a lot of the weapons that are being developed in the PRC uh, fit that category. The PRC, the People's Republic of China, regards the Asia-Pacific pivot as a strategy challenging their global rise. What message do you think an exercise like this sends to China? What we would hope that it would send is that uh, within international airspace and international uh, uh, waters and international law, that we all operate together and uh, peace, security, stability is beneficial to them in this region as well as all of us. They may take it in a different light and uh, uh, to be honest, I, I probably, probably wouldn't be fair for me to speculate what that was. It may not be seen as the way it's intended by us. We have to do a very careful evaluation of China. The threat, what it is, what it really consists of, not what the imagination would be. Let's not exaggerate it. Uh, once again, one sees ourselves on the brink of another arms race, which led to 70,000 nuclear weapons on the side. I think the arms race is already going on because China is aggressively trying to grow its capability. Uh, at this point, the United States is basically trying to maintain its capability. Why is it so hard in the United States to get a peace dividend? Because it's generally a false concept. We have global responsibilities, we have global obligations, uh, and that's not going to go away. I think we can get a peace dividend if people stand up and demand it. The way things are tending now, we'll probably have a smaller build down than we had after Vietnam, after the Cold War, after Korea. We're going to pivot to China and increase the defense budget. Right now, there is no existential threat to the United States. We can basically sit back, keep our powder dry, and fix other problems. Because we have economic troubles now, we need to reduce the defense spending that is so much a part of the distorting effects that have created these economic problems. Job one is to make ourselves adaptable to uncertainty as we move into the future. And you do that by being economically strong.